to 10 years uh, when we reach a consensus and uh, uh, maybe uh, unfortunate incidents which keep happening and that will make us realize that there is a need to have a uniformity much faster. I'll just, uh, uh, being a police officer, I'll just respond to what Mr. Deepak has said about the example he gave of the highway, that if a highway authority has made a beautiful highway and if people are exceeding the cross limit, uh, exceeding the speed limit. Now, I would say that I have been the traffic management chief of Hyderabad long time back, and I can tell you, as Pavan has mentioned, the concept of due diligence. So even highway authorities have been held responsible in incidents, in crashes, if there is lack of due diligence. Each highway authority is expected to have traffic and road signages. They are expected to provide proper lighting systems. They are supposed to uh, provide cautionary signs. They are expected to provide uh, you know, proper bends, which is you know, technically and uh, with engineering done at the curves. So if due diligence has not been exercised to minimize the possibility of incidents, they can be held responsible. So similar thing is applicable to the platforms being provided by the service providers. I think that's the concept. You, you're right. I, I think here the challenge is uh, that is there a list of what does the due, all due diligence mean? And I think that, that's where, which is still evolving, that uh, what does all due diligence actually mean? Because uh, different people may interpret it in different fashions. And I think if there's a move towards that type of uh, un common understanding as you're indicating, that would of course uh, help a whole lot of people to see what are the things that they should be looking at. Hi. <clears throat> I think the uh, kind of cyber crime that we are talking about today, it's more of where the crime is actually being committed in the cyberspace. But I believe that the cyber crime should also in its purview include the crimes where the crime is being committed physically, but the planning for the crime is, is happening on the cyberspace. For example, the terrorist attacks that we have seen where the crime is being committed physically somewhere, but the perpetrators of the crime, they are you know, talking over the emails or through some communication medium over the internet and planning for it. And hence, I believe we need a greater cooperation from the service providers where this 2B Cyber Interpol or the Cyber Police can intercept some such communications while it is happening and stop the crime before it actually happens. I can't agree more with you. In fact, that was that is the emerging thought process that's evolved amongst many countries. Earlier countries thought cybercrime has only got to do what's happened at cyberspace, but now the, the definition is getting broadened. It's any activity that's either targeted at the internet or that's done using the internet. So today when, uh, uh, say, a terror attack takes place at Bombay, now the terrorists are today a smart cookie. They are now not sending emails because they know governments are looking to their emails. So they have now come up with a more ingenious methodology. What does the methodology consist of? They open up any account, any account in a generic uh, free web-based email uh, service provider, maybe a Yahoo or a whatever, and then this account and its passwords is then disseminated to all members of the group across the world. And a message is made, it's drafted, and is saved in the drafts folder. The message is read by the concerned person who has to read it in another jurisdiction. He reads it and thereafter he proceeds uh, forward to implement it. So no effective, uh, shall I say, communication what transmitted on the internet, but at the same time, internet was very effectively and ingeniously used in a manner uh, to go ahead and perpetuate these kinds of cyber crimes. So I can't agree more with you that these kinds of uh, methodologies are now currently finding f more favor with the legislators, with the governments of the world. And I think the bigger challenge is going to be furthermore, how do you actually go ahead and demarcate and de distinguish legitimate activity versus activity that could be part of a criminal uh, activity, but that's unknown. For example, my computer system is taken is overtaken without my knowledge by somebody in some other jurisdiction it is made a part of a botnet and then it is used as a, a, a ground for launching attacks i have no clue what's happening but my computer is at fault are you going to punish me for this 
And how do I prove my non-knowledge? The next time there's a terrorist attack and the police comes in, they don't listen to you anything you. They just put you, put you up in the jail. So what do you do? I think somewhere down the li line, the law would need to balance the need for legitimate defense vis-a-vis -vis the need for criminalizing patently illegal activities which are using the networks. So can't agree more with you. Thank you for that suggestion. Now there is the botnet attack. Somebody sits at US and uh, hacks a system in Nigeria and does a crime in India. So now the jurisdiction, where is the jurisdiction like? Right? Now, when you talk about jurisdiction, there are three kinds of, uh, or there are two kinds of jurisdiction that you can look at. One is a criminal jurisdiction and one is a civil jurisdiction. You are sitting in America, you hack my uh, system in, in, in Hyderabad, it's used as a botnet for making an attack to Nigeria. Three countries are involved, uh, USA, India, Nigeria. Now, where does the final attack take place? The final attack takes place in Nigeria. So Nigeria, if it has a law on, or if it has a normal criminal jurisprudence, would be well within its rights to take cognizance of it, register the case. It will be a different issue altogether whether they will be ultimately able to reach up to me and via me to the guy in the US who's done it. But it will have to be part of an overall international approach because today a large number of countries even don't have basic treaties of extradition with each other. So consequently, there are major challenges, but you will typically, in an utopian scenario, you will need to take uh, and employ the law enforcement agencies of USA, of India, and of Nigeria working closely together to find out the real guy who's sitting in the US who's done this. Because unfortunately, in this, uh, in this uh, shall I say, newfound craze to regulate very strongly all kinds of cyber crimes, we should not go ahead and trample upon the privacy and individual rights of honest, bona fide netizens and users. And here, I think, network service providers have a huge role to play. We've had a catastrophe in this regard in India. I'll tell you this case. This is a case pertains to uh, a Western state of Maharashtra, where Bombay is situated. Now, in Maharashtra, there's, there are very regional parties. There's one very regional local political party that's very much in power. And somebody wrote up a blog. The blog said something very defamatory about our national uh, a historical leader by the name of Shivaji. He is considered as a, as a hero and a national leader. And uh, he was somewhere there uh, about a couple of hundred years back. But somebody wrote something defamatory about him. This political party took upon it so itself to launch a campaign. They put so much pressure on the, on the police, the police had to register a case. Now, when they registered a case, they went on using the normal IP address uh, routing route to find out. And they got the final IP address from where the comments were uploaded on this uh, blog. Now, this IP address belonged to one of the top uh, ISPs of the country. They went to the ISP and said, hold on. To whom did you allocate this, ISP, uh, this IP address on this date and time? The ISP looked into the records and said, sir, it's ABC. The police went and arrested ABC. Fifty days later, the ISP came back to the police. Oops, we are sorry, sir. It's not ABC, it is XYZ. So they, the police released ABC and picked up XYZ. Now ABC, who is a software engineer, whose life has been shattered, and who's been thrown out of employment has now sued the network service provider, the ISP, for 10 crore rupees damages or 100 million rupees as damages for loss of his independence, of his uh, reputation, goodwill, and, and the life as well. His life is now completely changed. Now, we don't, we don't want that these kind of instances should start happening. The police, the governments have well within their rights to go ahead and prosecute cyber criminals, but by no stretch of imagination should, should innocent people who've got nothing to do with it uh, be included in this entire purview. We don't want normal netizen community who's only using the internet for legitimate purposes should be made an unnecessary target in these kinds of approaches. Yes, we are willing to give some part of our privacy. Yes, we want cyber crimes to go down. We want cyber terrorism to go down. But at no stretch of imagination do I want to mortgage my entire free Freedom, my liberty to say the government can go and put me behind bars under the so-called garb of saying we are going ahead and controlling cyber crimes. Because cyber crimes are far more technical, are far more easier in terms of tracking and are easier in terms of potential conviction possibilities, I think governments, law enforcement agencies and network service providers need to be extremely careful in this regard. Otherwise it can be mayhem because uh, the anger of netizens can be shown a lot uh, more uh, 
demonstrably on the internet. A question back. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand, and perhaps you could explain one more time, the rationale for the broad concept of cybercrime, that cybercrime should be any crime committed via or with the assistance of the internet. Because if something is a crime, it's a crime. It's already prosecutable. And the question of, as it were, what the substantive offense should be is separate from the means available that should be, uh, the means that should be available uh, that are used to investigate it. And you raised the very serious problem of jurisdictional, cross-jurisdictional cooperation in a timely fashion. But whether those cross-jurisdictional methods for timely access and interception are going to work really doesn't touch the question of how you define the crime or the severity of punishment of the crime. What is the rationale for this broad notion of cybercrime? Why shouldn't one actually confine the notion of cybercrime to crimes which are about and attacks on the network? Thank you for that question. I think uh, the reason for this broad uh, ambit of this new concept of cybercrime primarily is if you are going to limit yourself to existing penal legislations in existing national jurisdictions, you are potentially going to have problems. Primarily because national uh, legislations were never written, keeping in mind uh, these kinds of emerging criminal activities on the network. Let me give you an example. India has got a penal code. The penal code in India was written in the year 1860. Now, at 149 years ago, you could not have faulted the British rulers to have not thought of the network or the crimes that could have taken on the network. Similarly, the new kinds of emerging crimes, for example, phishing. When you go ahead and fish for my confidential data and then you misuse it, well, technically you can still say, I could try to cover it under the offense of cheating, or I could try to cover it under the, the classical offense of criminal breach of trust. But whether in each and every case you will be able to do so, I think we are beginning to face a lot of challenges. And that's the reason why there's a need for a much bigger kind of a concept of a body known as a cybercrime. Well, hold on. Today, new kinds of cybercrimes are happening. How, how, how about these recent Mumbai attacks? The, the uh, terrorist had a satellite phone. The satellite phone gave him remote instructions of when to kill, when, what, whom, where, in how numbers. Now hold on, this is a criminal, criminal activity. You could try to do it uh, under your normal criminal uh, penal uh, laws, but somewhere down the line as lawyers we find that we, we invariably find so many loopholes under the existing provisions to get the accused out that you often find that while we have won the small battle, the war of the nation has been lost. We may, have, we may be successful in our professional capacities of getting the accused out or uh, scot-free, but hold on. The, 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 the nation has lost as a whole because you still have not have managed to put the guy onto the mat. I'm sorry, but with respect, that answer seems to suggest that you should be re -mod modernizing and revising the substantive primary offense. Uh, if we take the analogy of it were the invention of mail fraud in the, in the United States, I mean, that was a case where uh, a, a, a specially severe punishment and crime was associated with a cross-jurisdictional offense purely for the expedient means of being able to define a new offense with exceptional severe, severe, severe punishment as a federal crime. But, I mean, that isn't a, a case study that should be followed. Surely one should be trying to define laws which define the substantive offense properly and the means of investigation of that offense and whether that means of investigation is efficient is really a question of interjurisdictional cooperation and whether you define an offense isn't going to touch that question of the efficiency of jurisdictional cooperation. I would, uh, I would tend to agree with that thought process because that's yet another way of looking at it and I can't agree more with you for the very simple reason, well ultimately we are moving in the same direction. Well, it's not, uh, am I moving to the ocean in my small stream? Am I going into the big river? Or is it a main rivulet? So long as you're moving in the same direction, and even if you're up upgrading your laws to take the sub substantive crime far more broad and generic, that will also help. Though, of course, uh, you know, you will invariably have, uh, you know, problems like this guy in Korea, the boy in Korea killed the other boy because the other boy uh, stole his virtual sword in a virtual game. Now, these kinds of aberrations will still continue to exist, but that's a good thought process that if you can expand your broad 
uh, generic crimes in a far more broader manner. And if they can take care of existing kind of challenges on cyberspace, we'll be more than happy to do that. And I think that's something that should also be equally looked at as a very reasonable and viable option. I totally agree with you, sir. Yeah, thank you uh, for this excellent question and discussion session. And uh, this, we have uh, very limited time. Like, I would like to wrap up this session. First, uh, when we look at what are the IT policies in various developing countries, it's, it's very clear there are very less number of countries have enacted IT Act. And there is much more things needs to be done. And um, is it possible to have one common set of guidelines and policies for all nations? No. We can have common set of principles. And uh, we can give the flexibility to the nation state to adapt it to the local condition. So who would develop that common principles? So then that question comes up. And uh, then the question of jurisdiction. Yes, the jurisdiction issue is a very big uh, concern. And we needed, when we ta wanted to tackle cybercrime, we needed multi-jurisdiction uh, approach. And uh, is there a need for an international body like the Interpol for the internet? Yes, there is a need. And uh, how do we do it? Do we need to reinvent the wheel? Or we need to join hands together? Already, we, uh, it was very clear from both the uh, panelists uh, Council of Europe has enacted Cybercrime Convention, and uh, already 40, 45 nations have joined. And uh, we can take it forward from there. That's uh, my uh, submission. And uh, we could always have an online discussion on this. And uh, we would, uh, would like to really work with uh, all the panelists and this board here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thanks to our panelists. And I would like to invite Jaya to. Uh, Deepak and uh, Pavan, uh, these have been uh, people who have been working on and thinking and contemplating, and, and, and a num number of you who have been here uh, thinking of this discourse um, and reflecting on some of these issues, sometimes uh, also facing some of these challenges uh, in a very practical way. Uh, if any of you are interested to continue uh, this dialogue uh, in an online space, uh, please write to um, Vignesh, V-I-G-N-E-S-H, Vignesh, at C-S-D-M-S dot I-N. So, um, and then we'll put you on together into an online uh, forum that we will continue this uh, dialogue on. And if you think that there are other people who might be interested, please let us know. Thank you, Pavan. Thank you, Deepak. Thanks to all of you for um, attending this session.